Welcome to the MUSA lecture series for the fall of 2022. Uh, we'll take a few moments to let the um, audience filter in, sit tight, and we will get to our program um, beginning in just a moment. Um, for those of you, um, as you're filing in, um, who are not familiar with the MUSA program, um, which is hosting this lecture, I will post the link in the chat if you are watching this online after the fact. Oh, so you can find information about the MUSA program at design.upenn.edu slash MUSA, M-U-S-A. Um, okay, so um, let's get started. Uh, my name is Michael Fitchman. Uh, I'm a lecturer in the Master of Urban Spatial Analytics program at the in the Department of City and Regional Planning, University of Pennsylvania Weitzman School of Design. And I want to welcome you all to our first lecture of the 2022-23 um, academic year. And we, I want to thank uh, Penn IUR, Institute for Urban Research, um, for co-sponsoring this event with us. And I'd also like to thank um, the Weitzman School's um, Department of Communications for helping us put this event together, as well as um, our departmental assistant, Shinjie Zhang and Arden Jordan from Penn IUR. It's um, very nice to have a great team when we're putting together awesome events with awesome speakers, like uh, the person who's joining us tonight, Michael Schnurla. And so Michael is, um, I'm very excited to have Michael joining us, um, in part because I've had a great courtside seat to much of what he's been doing over the last number of years. Um, and the uh, what we do in the MUSA program um, is we train the next generation of data scientists who are concerned or, or um, adjacent to issues of public policy. Um, so that uh, also relates to urban planning and a number of other disciplines um, where we have students across the school who take different, um, uh, who have uh, dual degrees with us. And our students, what we think distinguishes them um, and what we try to offer in terms of a unique experience is the ability to use data science tools that you might see, say, in the in the private sector um, for uses that benefit the general public. And we really try to emphasize knowing something about your world, right? So we're not just talking about a, raising a new generation of computer engineers um, or uh, just pure data scientists. We want to understand something about um, housing or um, hunger or education, or as we'll be talking about tonight, transportation in the urban environment. And so bringing um, specialized knowledge and data science together, uh, we think is the special special sauce that we try to cook up here. So um, Michael is, uh, was Louisville's first chief data officer um, in the Office of Civic Innovation and Technology. And that is where I came to work with him on a number of student practicum projects uh, with my late colleague, Ken Steiff and Professor Matt Harris. And um, while Michael was with the city of Louisville, he worked to use data to improve government performance and transparency uh, with responsibility for open data, citywide data strategy, and fostering employee data-driven decision-making. So we cross paths. We cross paths because I think our values uh, were very much aligned in terms of how we saw data in the public sphere. Um, and Michael is now uh, working with the Open Mobility Foundation as director of open source operations, um, having spent 14 years in civic tech, 24 years working on projects for Fortune 500 companies and startups, um, and as he. he grew into a career in open data advocacy, civic services built around real-time transportation, safety, data standards, geocoding APIs. Um, and so he is in some ways the ideal guest to talk to people who are MUSA uh, adjacent, MUSA affiliated or current MUSA students. And I'm very excited for this talk tonight. So without further ado, uh, Michael Schnurla. 
Thank you for joining us, Michael. Great. Thank you, Michael. That's a great introduction. I hope I can live up to it. Um, as you, I'm going to just mention a few things um, about the program itself. I think that the MUSA program, from my time with it, um, and I'll get into some of the projects with my talk, but it's really unique. Uh, you know, I was not able to find another program like this where, as a city employee, um, we could work together and collaborate on real issues and real data analysis and real outcomes for residents in a city. There, there wasn't anything else like it, not in where I was in, in Louisville, Kentucky or elsewhere. Um, and I had a lot of connections with different other um, chief data officers that were in other cities as well. But the MUSA program was really unique. We did multiple, pro I think five projects over uh, three years. Um, and I think maybe even one after I left. But um, yeah, it was, it's a great pro pro uh, program. And you, know, you all are probably getting into all of this you're definitely getting into it way earlier than I got into it. So my background, as you'll see, and as Michael talked about a little bit, it started mostly in the private sector and sort of in computer science and engineering, a um, little bit of graphic design, that sort of stuff. And I'm not trained as a data scientist, but over the years, um, I got into um, databases, managing a lot of data, then doing analysis and mapping of that data and then learning on my own and, and really um, just pushing myself into the areas that I was most interested in. And so where I am now, I could not have guessed it from the beginning, um, but it's been a very, if you look back on it, it's a very cohesive path through um, sort of critical thinking, um, data, the starts of data science and visualization and mapping through to transparency, open data, and then focusing in on transportation related data and the uh, an open source development of that as well. So I'll sort of lead you through some of that during this talk. And I also want to just mention uh, Ken Steiff as well. He was a real inspiration and you know, we met um, in Boston for the first time and just face to face and hit it off. And that's when we started collaborating um, together while I was with the city. So he was just a real force and um, a pleasure to work with and be around and talk to. So definitely miss him. And um, I'm glad to see though that the program is still continuing and and Michael, um, good job with it uh, for your part with it. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so um, this is the topic for today. I'm gonna focus mostly on mobility, uh, but mention topics around open source development, data standards, data analysis, and privacy. Um, and I also included this slide here as because I just really like the design of it. Um, nice work on that, um, everyone over there. Uh, it, we'll, we'll see how these the rest of these slides go. I actually have 75 of them. I'll probably go pretty fast. Um, please, I guess, take notes if you want to ask a question about something. We're gonna save the questions for the end. But if you see something that pikes your interest or um, you really want to ask some more about it, please take a note and we can uh, discuss it more at the end and go back to those slides if we want. So I'm going to start with my time in city government. So this was actually just six years ago. So not that long ago over my career, but um, I think it's where it's most relevant to um, you all today. So I was the chief data officer for the city of Louisville, Kentucky in uh, the Office of Civic Innovation and Technology. So my role was data management for the city, um, not really the nitty gritty, but more of about um, getting employees to be able to manage their own data and then use it effectively. So we were trying to really build through what we called our data governance internal team. Um, we we're trying to empower all these employees to become their own mini data scientists the, with their ability to understand data, to catalog it, to um, manage it for their department, to be able to do analysis on it, visualization, mapping, sharing, um, and then covered also with our training program that we had in the city. We developed it while I was there. Um, uh, different trainings on privacy, ethics, bias, and security. Uh, but really, we were trying to just give people the tools they needed to 
to do their job and tools they didn't have before and they and really empower them in each department. So um, that data governance team was probably the most important thing I did with the city, even though it was very internal facing, it, I think it had a big impact. Um, I also managed the city's open data program, which is why I was very interested in the role in the first place, um, because I had been pushing for open data for years and helped the city actually build its website before I was in this role. Um, and so to manage that was what I wanted to do. And I, you know, I did that and it was great, but really this internal training of people was, I think the most impactful. And of course we had a, with that, we had a lot of collaborations with, um, university, private companies, nonprofits, um, and government projects, uh, in and outside of the city and the state and around the world. So, um, very, uh, interesting position and. To give you a sense of where this sits, and there are probably now maybe two dozen cities in the US that have a chief data officer type role, but they sit each in probably different areas in the structure of the city. So I happen to be in this innovation office, which was on the same level tangential to the technology and IT department. Sometimes the CDOs are in the IT department, sometimes they're totally separate. Sometimes they're in the mayor's office. So I was sort of a, in a combination of all of that, but it was great because I was at the same level as the IT director, but we had the same supervisor, the same boss. And so we were able to actually get things done from a technology standpoint because of that, but we weren't necessarily, our team wasn't really burdened by some of the IT infrastructure and rules that uh, would otherwise be there. We were more, in the, in the innovation side, which allowed us to be more creative and try different things without so much feel, fear of failure. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of where I sat in that department. And it was my first time in city government. Um, I, I put this on Twitter a few days ago. It was um, songs that star a city employee as the protagonist. And the first one I thought of was Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, which you know, mentions that Yoshimi is working for the city. And so she's a city employee. Um, and I wanted people to come up with other songs that had a protagonist that worked in government and it started city and state and we got a few federal in there. So we ended up making a playlist from that on Twitter, but it's, um, it, you know, if you ever get the chance to work in, especially city government, I'd say, um, along your career, you should really take it because it really has um, you can have a lot of impact and you can bring your skills into this. And I sort of saw it as a, as a bit of a service. Um, like I was trying to help my city, my community, and I did it for four years, um, but it was very rewarding. And honestly, I would have kept doing it if this opportunity with the, with the OMF didn't come along. Um, it just, uh, I just decided it was a little bit, um, better and a little forward thinking and but not necessarily time for a change. It was very rewarding. Um, so anyway, if you have a chance to work in government, please do. So um, just to go over a few of the things that I did while I was in city government, um, we, I managed the open data website for the city. Um, we tried to get, we had a data inventory. We tried to get every department to publish all of their data. We had an open by default policy from the mayor which was just actually just a month ago codified by the, the city council um, as an ordinance to publish open data. And so there was this mandate to get as much data out as you could and uh, redact what you needed to for privacy. So we did a good job. We had a lot of people use the data. Um, I'm trying to see if, I don't think in this screenshot we have any news and stuff, but this is just a small sampling of the, the public gallery of, of people and organizations that used our data that we were able to find out about. There's a lot of people that use open data and we just don't know as a city, um, but we tried to keep a gallery of everything we could. Um, one of the ones that really got me into the transportation space a little bit more, instead of being just a data generalist was the um, DACA scooters. So um, with the scooter, and I'll talk a little more about scooters later with the OMF, but Scooters were dropped on cities starting in 2017 or so. And um, cities really needed data to manage these devices in the public right of way. And um, they would get data back from uh, the operators and then 
that taking that data, which included trip lines, but did not include any driver or rider information, um, there's still concern for privacy. So anonymizing that appropriately and adding the right privacy protections before publishing it was a very interesting task and um, something that really each city, even to this day, is kind of doing in a different way, but this is how we handled it. And if you have questions about that methodology later, we have a, I have a write up of it, but um, it was a fun challenge and really provided a lot of insights about how the right of way was used for these devices. And it really helped with building out infrastructure and other issues in the city. So our mayor, um, we had a big data-driven culture in Louisville. So we, I was in a good position, uh, a good role with a good mayor in a good city that had this culture. He was a three-term mayor. His term ends this election cycle after um, three years is the max. Um, but Mayor Greg Fisher was great, and he really got data. He spoke at Code for America. Um, and we used the data to make decisions. Um, I wanted to show this because this was part of the empowerment of the different employees. So this is an example of a report I did every, I did two reports like this every week for a report out to the mayor with different uh, teams for our performance improvement teams. This was a public works report. And you can see on the right, the public works employees that were attending events. We just started this one in 2020 before COVID. And each of them would get awards and badges for doing different things. Um, so we tried to highlight those people that were doing the data work. And then on the left, we sort of had things that were working and things that weren't working in the department as far as open data went, uh, highlighting data projects, how's the data inventory going and how many badges. We had these uh, merit badges that, uh, for data that we would give employees. So everyone that was in leadership in the city could see how each department was doing in these report outs. So this was part of that culture of data and then part of the uh, making sure the employees were recognized and encouraging people to open more data, do data projects and uh, do data work. Um, during my time too, we ended up settling on Power BI um, as a tool to visualize. I'm sure you guys will use this and other tools to some degree. This was a great one for government because it was basically free if you were, had uh, Microsoft tools um, and if you just needed to pay for it if you wanted to publish things online. So very useful tool. It, it is easy to train people on it because it started off like Excel and then um, quickly got more interesting after that. So these were just a little random snapshots of some of the initial data projects. These aren't even really refined very much that different department employees did um, during their during my time there after they got some training. Um, there's a blog post about this too. So we'll share these slides afterwards and you can click some of the links in here. Um, one of the data sets, I'm going to go through a few uh, featured things in the city and then I'll move on to the OMF. But, um, one of the things we did early on with Power BI, uh, but with also some other data analysis was we took Waze data, the Waze navigation app. Um, they were able to share some anonymous data with cities and we were able to visualize it to do things like free on-demand traffic studies. So instead of having to line up um, a bunch of money and time and contractors to do traffic studies for us, we really could use the Waze data. and. In many ways, we, we did some analysis with actually some University of Louisville students and um, determined that this was at least as accurate and probably more accurate than any of the other paid consultant work that had been done in the past. Um, so we were able to really present this information to the traffic teams and they're able to do things like fix lights and look at problems and in intersections and it's all interactive. So one of our first big data projects uh, in transportation specifically uh, was this one with Waze data. Um, this is one of the Musa practicum projects that we did uh, towards maybe the, towards the end, maybe this was 2018 uh, or 19, yeah. So this was predicting fire risk. So this was interesting. We, we worked with the fire department. They wanted to know where they should be focusing their outreach for free smoke detector 
um, distribution. And really what they have been doing is just sort of randomly going around to neighborhood centers and offering them to groups who ever wanted them. Uh, they didn't know how to target it anymore. So we were able to give a bunch of data um, about f previous fires and some other built environment information. And the students in the program built this, and this was an interactive tool and we actually exported this, but it showed where the fire risk was the highest in the city. And then the fire department put that information into their outreach system. And they were gonna target this when I, right when I left in 2020, they were gonna use this data to target these areas for a year and see if there was an impact in the property damage over that year versus previous year. Because smoke detectors won't stop a fire, but they will um, get people out and um, get the fire department there sooner than if there were no, no smoke detectors. So I don't know the outcome of that, but we worked with the fire department the whole time during this project. And it was a really good um, collaboration between you know, someone in my role as a generalist and the, the specific department and the students. So this was, I'll show you some other projects, but this was probably the most ideal project because it, we had the department on board. They were actually gonna use the data. They knew it from the beginning. So we had a real good use case, a real good project and a way for them to use it. And they were on board. Like sometimes you do a data project and you show it to a department and they, they think it's interesting, but they don't know how to use it or they don't understand it or they weren't along for the ride. And I think having them along is very important for having your work be noticed and used at the end of it. Because um, otherwise it sort of can be, become stale quickly or maybe it's not really solving a real problem. Um, there's another project with predicting congestion based on Waze data. That was interesting as well. Um, we, we didn't work as closely with the traffic engineering team on this, but they did find it useful and then were able, were able to go back and use Waze data to fix the bigger problems that they saw here. Um, this was one, another transportation one. This was trying to predict scooter demand even though the scooters were not being placed equitably in i think it's 12 different cities we looked at so by using scooter data then you all were able to do an analysis of where scooters should be deployed and if they were deployed there how much they would get used so basically how much money would the operators make if they chose to deploy these devices in low income areas specifically and it was interesting because what this showed and what happens in a lot of cities is, you know, the, the companies might decide that they want to place the devices in the biggest commercial areas of a city and you get some people using it for, um, you know, social rides or just fun rides and things like that. But if you actually place it in areas that need this sort of transportation, the rides become longer. Um, they're, they're used more frequently and reliably, and the devices are actually very useful for residents. So um, this was a great project because in these cities and in Louisville in particular, we were able to update our policy to tweak it and target certain areas that we had not been targeting before. So another great project, and this was another one where the department was involved as well from throughout the project. So um, that was a nice one. All right, so I'm going to go on to the Open Mobility Foundation now, which is where I am. Um, so if you have questions about um, city stuff or, and I'll, I'll talk about cities some more, think about those and we'll come back to them. So the Open Mobility Foundation. So you, as, as traffic engineers and public works departments and what everyone here sees out in the real world, um, has really been the building of physical infrastructure to communicate rules uh, to people that are walking or riding a bike or in a car. Um, and this is, you not only need this physical infrastructure and have needed it um, to do things like payments and what's allowed and what's not allowed, but also to prevent people from doing things that are illegal. You know, you have curbs, you have blocked off streets, um, you have different 
traffic calming measures, et cetera. All of that is how we've done things and it's, um, it's effective, but it's pretty costly and hard to change. So starting, you know, maybe a decade and a half ago, um, there's been this need for digital infrastructure. So apps, Google Maps, Waze, um, all the ones you're used to using as a consumer, those are all out there, but um, the cities have also gone to starting to digitize their infrastructure. Many cities, for instance, before this time period, didn't know where their parking meters were or their curbs, didn't have a digital record of that, didn't maybe even necessarily digitally define their streets very well. And so this, there's this, been this need for digital infrastructure, which then can affect the real world environment in a similar way to what the physical infrastructure can do. And so that's where the OMF, the OMF kind of grew out of this need for digital infrastructure. So our vision is to manage public space for the public good. Um, we build data standards and open source tools, and we're definitely public and private collaboration. And we encourage responsible growth of new mobility services like scooters, bike share, TNCs, uh, sidewalk delivery robots, et cetera. And we wanna build cross-sector relationships with people that have this shared vision for mobility. So we wanna, in some ways it's building the city uh, transportation operating system of tomorrow. Um, so that's where we sit. And we're a nonprofit, we're an open source foundation. Uh, we build common standards for digital governance and this helps support a business ecosystem as well, which helps to get things done and provide services to people operating in the public right of way and to cities. We have about 50 members right now. This is some of them, uh, some cities at the top and companies at the bottom. Um, the, it's, it's free for cities to join and companies pay based on their um, employee numbers. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a great collaboration. Lots of people are working together. Um, we have members from, as you can see, the United States, Canada, Europe, um, South America, where else do we have members? Um, yeah, Canada, Mexico. So a lot of people have joined, cities have joined and private companies as well that operate in a lot of those areas. Um, and then many, many more use our data standards and I'll get into that later. So we wanna, everything we built is built collaboratively. We do it all in public working groups. So anybody, all of you could join any of the meetings at any time, we have a public calendar. We usually have at least one, maybe two public meetings a week on different topics. Um, and all the work is visibly put on GitHub. So even if you don't join the meeting, you can look on GitHub, see the work that we've done, leave comments, offer suggestions. If you're familiar with GitHub, you can do pull requests and, and make suggestions as well. Um, and this builds a competitive market, market for mobility services and tools. And we work collaboratively with other open source projects like um, the, there's another organization called Mobility Data and they manage GTFS, which you might be familiar with around transit and GBFS and those specs are also changing and updating just like ours are. In the middle of this picture, you see MDS, that's one of our data standards, uh, mobility data specification, which I'll talk about later. The other important thing about the OMF is we have a governance structure. So many times with open source projects, uh, you're not really sure who's managing it or who could affect change. And with standards that companies and cities are using, it has to be a little bit more stable. So we definitely have releases and versions, but we also have a governance and approval process. There's public um, working groups for different specs. There's member networks, we have events, roundtables, and public discussions. And then on top of all that, we have a layer of volunteers from the membership, which is cities and companies. We have a strategy committee, a tech council, a privacy committee, and then finally a board of directors, which is made up entirely of city employees. Um, it's the only nonprofit I know of that is a hundred that where the board is a hundred percent city employees. Usually there's some mix in that, uh, but we're, we're city led, which I think helps produce a, a great product for everybody. 
So our first product, as you might call it, is the mobility data specification. And it was initially built in 2017 by Los Angeles Department of Transportation as a way to manage scooters and get data from operators. It eventually came into our um, purview as the OMF was created in 2019. Um, because Los Angeles realized that they couldn't be just the one city that's managing and governing this data spec because by at that point, probably over maybe at least probably a hundred cities were already using MDS and they, they wanted it to have better structure. So they created the OMF with a group of 15 cities. And now we're in we're in 160 cities that we know of, 21 countries. It's probably actually more like 300, 400 cities. We just don't know exactly because it's open source and anyone can reference it and point to it. Um, it we have a marketplace of tools around MDS. You know, it was initially and now focused on e-scooters, mopeds, and bicycles. But soon it's and with MDS 2.0, I'll mention this in a little bit. Taxis, TNCs, delivery robots, car share will all be officially supported, even though people have been using MDS for those modes um, anyway in sort of like their own versions of MDS. So what is MDS exactly? It's it, in a way, it's like a plumbing layer between cities and private companies, a way, a two way um, share of information. So cities can actually publish information about geographic areas, rules, policies, what they need operators to do to comply with um, their regulations. And then companies publish data back about their operations in the public right of way so that cities can monitor compliance and um, billing, billing the operators and uh, other things like that. So MDS sits in the middle and allows that two way data communication that everyone agrees upon. This is a more detailed view of the different parts of MDS. We have um, Below at the bottom there is data from cities. So cities can publish policy and their jurisdictional details, geographic areas and metrics that they get after using the data from the operators. And the operators publish what we call provider and agency APIs and endpoints. So provider, if you're this is a little technical, but provider is a is a pull mechanism. So the city pings the operator and pulls data down about all these different things you see here, trips and events and vehicle information etc and agency is the opposite it's a it's a push mechanism where operators push data to the city as it happens uh, around vehicles and vehicle events and telemetry and things like that so most cities have chosen to use provider because it's a little bit easy it puts more weight on the operators in some ways but there are a lot of cities that use agency especially in europe uh, for that more dynamic and and push mechanism and really agency is probably the way things are going um, but any, either of those ways work with mds and mds is meant to be very flexible so some cities use maybe 10 percent of this and some cities use you know 70 percent of this um, but it's up to the city based on their needs to choose which parts they want to use and not use so i'll go through a few let me go back a few use cases here um, this is the Pitchfork uh, Music Festival in Chicago. So they wanted to, they set up a digital geofence for scooters and a, a, a buffer around it and publish that out to the operators. And this was some of the results. You could see the sort of like the clustering at the red border. That's where devices had to stop and ended up stopping. And then for the ones that didn't, they were able to go back to the operators and either penalize them or talk to them about why they didn't follow the rules. Um, and then the next time they did it, it was better. So it's an example of digital infrastructure that was affecting the operation of the vehicles. Um, safety improvements is another big use case for MDS. Santa Monica used MDS data to come up with and optimize its bike plan, its five-year and long-term vision for um, bike facilities. So that's a very common use case you can see where people are riding the devices and, and assume that's where some good safe infrastructure should be put. Um, so that's one use case. Transit connections is another. Um, this was in Los Angeles. They wanted, they basically used this information to 
look at activity around transit connections, and then create mobility hubs and other um, incentives for people to use transit um, in addition to using the scooters. And the scooters become sort of that last mile solution for transit. Um, equity analysis is another big use of MDS data. Here's um, something from Chicago's ePilot evaluation. So they're able to um, check on the status of deployment of types of scooters throughout the day. This is just a snapshot, but they really did a, a deep analysis of one, were the companies complying with equity deployment, but also were the devices being maintained and who was actually using the devices? Because um, there were some, there's some ways where companies could cut corners around this and they wanted to make sure everything was operating properly and they, they did the right knobs and levers to make sure that, that things worked well. Um, this is an example from Louisville that I did. So we had this in the, the purple line there is one street called Eastern Parkway. Um, it's actually a, a, a park that's um, a street as well. But we were looking at um, redesigning it to provide you know, bike facilities and protected lanes and um, calmer, traffic calming and things like that. And what came up a lot was, well, people don't use that corridor for riding bikes. So why would we put infrastructure there? But you can see here, these the lines in green are every scooter trip that touched that corridor. And so you can see, and this was a great argument before our city council, to say like, hey, look, people are using this all the time and it's not just people in the area. People are using it and cutting across the city with these trips all over the place. So we definitely need to improve infrastructure there. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the data that's in MDS. Um, you've seen a version of this before, but it's definitely two-way. Um, we'll talk, you know, open data is one thing. This data is really meant for city employees to use as a way to regulate the operators. Um, a slice of it could be made to open data, like I mentioned before, but it's a private communication tool as opposed to something like GBFS, which is the general bike share specification. And that is meant to publish the location of available scooters and bikes for apps like Transit and, and other apps to use so that people can reserve the scooters. This is more for operations. Um, and this is a little bit of a privacy and data funnel you can see here. So on the left, the vehicle and the app from the operator, they have a lot of rider data. You know, they have names and, and all sorts of financial and license plate pictures, or I'm sorry, driver's license pictures sometimes. They have the vehicle data, trip data, financial data, um, all that sort of stuff from the apps and the vehicles goes to the company. The company manages that. And then a subset of that vehicle and trip data is securely transferred to the city through MDS. So that's where they get a piece of that. And then through some open data processing and sunshine laws, some of it could be made public. So in MDS provider, which is one of our endpoints, um, this is taken from our privacy committees um, using MDS under GDPR guidance. GDPR is a sort of a data privacy framework in the EU, uh, but it applies to many things we do in the United States as well. So the of all the fields and information in MDS, the stuff on the left is what we flagged as potentially personal. So a vehicle ID, even though it's a random ID, could be potentially personal. Uh, because you could track that ID or that device around the city and maybe make some determinations of who is using it if you had other information. Uh, the vehicle's origin and destination, if you knew it started at this block and ended at this block and then took this trip route, you might also be able to infer some things, especially with repeat trips. And then there's there's one field called, a, it's a parking photo, which is optional, but sometimes companies allow uh, or require people to take a picture of how they park their vehicle. And sometimes that information goes to the city. So we flag those. Um, and then there's other stuff about like the trip distance and duration or the vehicle status, you know, is it operational, is it in use, that are not really personal. Um, but that's the extent of the personal data in MDS. We don't have any 
rider information or way to connect trips or anything like that. Um, so something, I'm going into some of this too, because if you ever do work with cities with MDS data, it gives you a little bit of a sense of what you could possibly do with it and what you can't do with it. So everything in the box on the right is data that's not included in MDS. So a lot of sensitive information, information about the rider, addresses, names, um, trip history, um, trip spending of a rider, any video or, or audio is not included either. Um, but some of the companies have a lot of this information. So um, researchers sometimes go right to the company and ask for a subset of data that could be more detailed and access accessible to, with a data sharing agreement than what the city has access to. Um, and then open data, I mentioned this, but the, we do have a catalog of all the open data sets on our GitHub website and that it's maintained by our privacy, security and transparency committee. So it's, we call it a state of practice. And it links to not only open data, but other things as well, like methodologies or reports that have been done using MBS data. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of a definition here of what open data is, must include a bulk download of the data, uh, but it's useful in making dashboards, maps, and visualizations. And you can see some of these here. We even categorize how the data was anonymized from MDS even more. So like timestamps to 15 minutes or hour or um, using some K and amenity um, rules for infrequent OD pairs, origin destination pairs. Um, rounding to even day of the month or times, et cetera. So you can see, and then the geography side as well. Does it get rounded and grouped into polygons, points, lines, et cetera. So each city does it a little bit differently. And usually that's because of state law or city policies that require some changes. Um, so here's just some quick examples. Austin, Calgary, and Chicago do it this way where they use polygons and bucket it into time and space increments. Um, is that really good for road use or infrastructure planning? Because you lose the, the data there of where trips were actually taken. Um, origin destination points is another way that sometimes cities publish it. Um, usually these are fuzzed a little bit to like three latitude and longitude decimal places, maybe binned, but it's really more useful for um, demand and duration, but again, not great for determining where your infrastructure needs to be because you don't know the trip line that somebody took. Um, street segments is another way that some cities use. Um, this is a little bit better for road use and infrastructure planning because you can see the density of trips on actual road segments. Um, but usually the, the trip start and end time and a distance duration or, or origin destination points are not included in this if a city chooses to do it. Um, and there's another way to do street segments, but more detailed, but aggregated at a higher time frame. So this one's actually by month, some of these screenshots here. Um, so you get more detailed information. It's um, a little more processed, but it's very, it's useful for, um, infrastructure planning and, and seeing where people are riding. Um, and we have a privacy guide for all this, um, how to share for MDS data is one of the ways, uh, one of the sections in this, this guide. Um, you can read this as well. And we had some best practices from other entities. But, you know, th this is useful for a lot of data that cities have. Um, you know, cities handle sensitive data all the time, as you probably know, you know, crime reports, emergency calls, 311, health data, property data, traffic crashes, et cetera. So MDS, compared to all of that, MDS is pretty, um, is le very, let's say less privacy sensitive than most of the other data. And cities have typically have rules for how to classify data and how to publish data. So. Um, we give them a little bit of help here with MDS, but cities have so far over the years been very good with handling and publishing the right kind of data with their own processes and laws. Um, we do have a, this is just flagging that we have an open issue to discuss um, how to officially de-identify trip data. This is an area where 
we have not been able to really crack this nut because of all the different pieces, as you all can probably imagine, of how to anonymize data that would work in any context, whether it's a maybe suburban context, an urban context, uh, some areas with low frequency of trips or high frequency um, with, uh, you, you can imagine like low income areas, high income areas. You can imagine a lot of different variables here, but how do you anonymize that appropriately so that you can still have useful information, but really reduce the risk of any sort of re-identification of trips. And so this is a, if you're looking for a project in the future, uh, this could be one you could tackle because we haven't been able to do it. And I think I have a little bit of information about this coming up. So MDS for researchers, we, we have had some webinars about this. So if you are a researcher and you want to use MDS, um, we have some recordings we can share and some notes and some best practices. Um, you know, it could be used to answer questions like um, how scooter placement affects travel patterns, uh, whether road conditions, how does that affect ridership, um, how different policies can affect ride choices, um, use cases about what works with MDS and what doesn't. But really, only a few non-commercial studies using MDS data have been published publicly. The one here I point out is the, the Musa one about the scooter equity and demand analysis, which is great. Um, but MDS data is not really suited for studies that involve any information about riders or understanding repeat trips by the same rider or justifying decisions about the detailed placement of scooters. So it has limitations, but there's still a lot that it can be used for either with the open data that's available or through a data sharing agreement with the city. Um, so how to get this data, you know, open data is the easiest. If cities have published it, you can go find it there. You can work with individual cities who are using MDS and that you can have an agreement. Um, if you want more detailed information, you'll have to go work with individual operators, um, which is nice though, because if they're in multiple cities, maybe you can look at multiple cities at once instead of one city at a time. Um, so there's, there's different ways to go about it and different levels of data aggregation. Um, here's some tips for working with cities that maybe this is pretty relevant to you all. Um, you know, the Musa program is good with building these relationships, but maybe the key things in here that I'd like to point out is kind of what I said at the beginning, which is you really need to work with cities to determine what study areas or research outcomes could be mutually beneficial and try to align your projects around that, those concepts with those departments. And that does help build a relationship. So over the years with Musa, my, our relationship built and we were able to do more and more projects to a year sometimes, and they got more um, complicated and more useful. So <clears throat> that relationship I think is really important. And if you can agree to publish your research like, like Musa does, that's very helpful as well. Um, so if you are, ever do get into this realm, whether it's through Musa or whatever, or through a city that's using MDS, you can always reach out to the OMF for help. And we can help provide guidance or maybe connections um, or help working with a city that you may be working with to understand the MDS data more appropriately. All right, so I'm going to get a little bit more into the future of MDS here. We are working on MDS version 2.0, and I mentioned it's going to be expanding officially to passenger services, car share, and delivery robots. So what does that mean exactly for 2.0 versus our current version, which is 1.2? Um, you can think of MDS as a like a mixer in your kitchen. Maybe some of you have this appliance. It's very useful. You can imagine it was something that the OMF designed and you can make great things for residents by using this out of the box tool called MDS. Um, and each city can start with a different base model. You get to pick maybe your color and maybe you have some recipes to support your mobility program. So that's what MDS has been like. And it's, you know, it's customizable in some way. Micromobility was the first use of MDS out of the box. And there's a lot of great recipes that you can used to create things with micromobility. You can manage scooters or dockless bikes or docked bikes. 
But in 2.0, what we did was we changed the architecture of MDS. We sort of went back to the blueprints and allowed new attachments, new ways to use the same base MDS model to do different things. So now you can swap out a piece of MDS for a new mode. So let's say you want to do passenger services. Now you can put that new attachment on for passenger services and you have new recipes for things like managing taxis and TNCs. Um, so that makes it easier out of the box with this one swap out to do other things. And for now with 2.0, we're going to have four total modes available, um, which I mentioned before, and that's they're going to be able to work with the upgraded MDS base model. But this also allows us to support future modes. So whenever a new mode comes along, and you can see some of them here, which have actually been under discussion, like urban air delivery, passenger you know, flight, urban air mobility, tunnels, of course, uh, remote uh, managed and shared pogo sticks, um, whatever it may be, if it's in the public right of way and it's some sort of shared device, MDS should be able to support that in future releases more easily because we've changed the way we can add these new attachments onto MDS. I want to touch on some privacy parts of MDS. We had a use case database, about uh, maybe three dozen use cases cataloged for MDS, which talked to each of the different MDS APIs you might want to use um, and what they need uh, with that use. So like what parts of MDS you need to make those use cases happen. So use cases are always where we start with, um, with, our, with any discussion. And this is a great place to get started. And it's a great place to think about privacy because you think about what you need first. Um, we've talked about this privacy workflow and we do have a number of resources. We have a privacy guide for cities, mobility data state of practice and a GDPR guide for the EU. Um, this guide is pretty useful if you're in the European Union. Very detailed, it's something like 70 pages of stuff, but it's on an interactive website. So it answers questions that are common in the EU, like can you process and collect the MDS data? What do you have to do um, for consent, for erasure requests, et cetera? And then this gets into something I talked about before, which is data redaction on some of our data and K values. Um, so if you're interested in this, you can see these factors here, geography size, population, time, um, audience, policy reasons, special types of riders, that all affects the risk variability of um, data re-identification. So we have a guide around this and we use these K values in some of MDS, but again, we'd love to look at this more, especially from a researcher angle. Um, the other thing we do with, um, with privacy is, um, and customizability, Cities typically have managed MDS with a permit requirement PDF, and they send out these PDFs and how things can be managed. But what we've done is we've created what we call the policy requirements feature, which is a digital way for cities to say which parts of MDS they want to use for a certain mode and use case and which parts they don't want to use. So for some jurisdictions, they don't want any trip data, trip line data. You can actually specify that digitally uh, which version of the API you want, which fields you do want, which fields you don't want. Um, so for instance, you could say, I just want to use provider with status changes, events, and vehicles. And, um, you know, the, I'll go through this, this example too. So in this example, you can see on this picture, this is what comes standard with MDS. You get a start location, a time, device ID, a route, and end location, but with the requirements feature, Cities can digitally specify, well, we want to add these optional fields to the parking image and the trip cost. But we can also say for our pilot program or because of a local law, we don't want these other fields. So we can not have the start location, the device ID or the route. Maybe we only want the start and end time and some other um, bigger geographic area. So that's allowed to be digitally specified within a structure like you see on the right within MDS. So that's how we hit privacy a little bit and give some flexibility to people using MDS in cities. All right, the last thing I want to touch on is the curb data spec. This is our other data specification. It's newer than MDS. It came out 
about a year ago. Um, it's already, well, I'll get into the details, um, but it basically helps pilot and scale dynamic commercial loading zones. So it allows cities to digitally express their regulations and measure activity at the curb, and then use the metrics to develop dynamic policies. It was developed in the open with 160 individuals from dozens of organizations. And we've got about two dozen cities and companies already using it on the ground. Um, it has also built a competitive marketplace for solutions and, and uh, services and software tools. And it was built with the same open model as MDS. And we took a lot of the learnings from MDS to build CDS. And here's a quick list of who's using it. You can see it in Pittsburgh, um, in use. Uh, Omaha is about to launch it, Seattle. And then these other organizations are either using it behind the scenes or they're about to launch something using CDS as well. And you can see it's got, especially with the private sector companies, it's got a big international reach, probably more so than MDS. And we, because of the learnings from MDS, we created a bunch of resources out of the box. Website, blog posts, slide deck, one pagers, the repository, of course, sample policy language, privacy guidance, and a pilot program guide. So it's easy for cities and companies to get started. Um, but what it does is it allows cities to say, here's the curb space, here are the rules. You can use anything to monitor that curb space. It can be a parking meter, it can be a camera, it can be a sensor in the ground, it can be data from the operator's um, vehicles themselves. And that gets synthesized into a standard event format and sent to the city. And then using metrics, able to refine that um, curb policy. So, um, this is just a little more detail on that, but it helps scale those dynamic curb zones. And in the end, you get these sort of metrics around curbs, uh, total sessions, turnover, dwell time, and occupancy percent. And you would be surprised that most cities don't know any of this for their curb zones. They don't track it. They don't put the different types of events and the data together. Um, so this is a new thing for a lot of a lot of cities, and it's. Um, tangential to MDS, and we're looking at merging them in the coming releases. So that's the end of my long talk. I hope you all stayed with me for that. Um, you can find us at openmobilityfoundation.org and on Twitter and on GitHub as well. So with that, I will, um, I think, hand it over to Michael for some questions or thoughts uh, from you or anyone else. Thank you. That was that was fantastic and like really that's all so fascinating and uh impressive. I maybe I'm just a super nerd, but that was like uh so much interesting information. Um so we can uh anyone um can feel free to put a question in the chat or the QA functions and um you know I will uh, moderate them, put them to Michael. Um I will I'll start. Um, while folks gather their thoughts, my um, I have a ton of questions, but the one that came to my mind first and foremost is to to ask you what um, what are the issues on the municipal side with being able to engage with something uh, like MDS or the curb data specification in terms of like their technical know how or their governance um, uh, their the the willpower or the governance directives um, or funding things like that because you've seen things from both sides I, I'm curious what your thoughts are about that yeah I think it's it's easier now for cities to engage than it was say three years ago um, because it used to be what the way it started was you know devices would show up on people on the city's streets and then they'd have to do something with it and then they'd create a policy about impounding the devices and then they go talk to the companies. And the first thing they wanna know is they wanna have data. They said, we wanna know where these things are so we can field complaints and see if you're um, you know, leaving them on sidewalks and piles or people are riding them dangerously. So they would used to just ask for data and sort of create a bulleted list of stuff. And then the operators, if they wanted to run their devices in the city, they'd had to go figure it out. But, but now that's, more well-defined what cities typically do is they will actually write mds into their policy so they'll actually say um 
you know, here's the operating policy if you're going to operate scooters or bike share or any of these other devices. And then for the data sharing requirements, it'll say, you know, we require the use of MDS, um, these parts of MDS, here's a link to it, and we can update this at any time. Um, some cities are actually pointing to their requirements file, which I mentioned, which is the digital expression of what the rules are around MDS, and they point to that that file online from their permit, and then they can update that file digitally whenever they want. Instead of sometimes updating the permit language takes months of approvals, but they can do it this way instead. Um, so that's like how you get it set up and how you get MDS data. It's it's relatively straightforward now, and that's what cities do. Um, and then once you start get collecting that data, um, you know, before you have that information and you're trying to operate, it might take like in Louisville, it took three people to try to figure out what all these companies were doing. But once MDS came through and then I was able to build a dashboard for them off the MDS data, then it became a half time employee uh, that could look at the dashboards and figure out violations and caps and um, fees and all that sort of thing from the data and then that's how cities started to do it they would do it themselves but now we have this ecosystem where for really inexpensively you know we're talking well i don't know if i what the the prices are now but you know twenty thousand dollars a year something like that you could get a basic understanding of all your operators um, through using mds through dashboards and automated tools and automated billing and it just takes care of it for you. So then it's just like another tool in your toolbox that you can manage the public right away with. And that's what 95% of cities use now is some vendor. Um, and there's a, a lot of them out there. Some of them are our members uh, to manage the MDS data flow at relatively little cost when you're thinking about a program like this. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And I think actually we have a question in the Q&A that was very similar about the benefits of the OMF for member cities that aren't as large, don't have mm -hmm. funding or staff for their own internal research. Yeah, so, I mean, Louisville is not that large. We have a, a number of very small cities. Um, we also have a lot of large cities. Uh, you know, it's free to join and you can either monitor from afar if you'd like or join and be, have a little bit more say in the direction and the roadmap of the MDS development or CDS development. But um, yeah, I, I don't know, it, it's not really a heavy lift. If you're in this space already, I think looking at what the OMF is doing really helps you do your job more effectively and it helps you leverage that network of cities that are already doing that same information. We have a, we have a member Slack channel, which gets a lot of use uh, from all the cities and companies in this space. Um, we have member events, webinars, roundtables, and then of course, a lot of public events as well you could join. So. It, it really helps simplify anything you're doing in this space um, if you if you keep up with what the OMF is doing and use our resources and our networks. I have a um, an excellent question from fellow uh, faculty member, Jumbe Po, um, who is also a um, veteran of civic technology. Um, so Jumbe asks, and he says it's a little long, um, can you talk a little about the process of developing MDS, particularly the kind of political and social negotiations and trade-offs that had to be made uh, to produce standards that work whether cities um, use the 10% or 70% of the spec? With open span standards, I think there's a perception that someone just comes up with it, publishes it, and then people start using it, but that's a very simplified description of what happens. Maybe if you have some memorable examples of concessions that were made or things that were controversial, things you thought would work or didn't, or other challenges in the design of MDS, it would be great to get a peek behind the curtain at those. Yeah, those are, that's a great question. And it's, um, you know, also with my civic tech background and open source background, that's a comp, what you mentioned in the second paragraph is a common problem where someone builds something, a standard or a tool and you publish it and it's free and anyone can use it, but people don't really go and use it because it requ it still requires some amount of understanding of infrastructure, of uh, maintenance on it. Um, and so I think it, for that part of it, the, because of our governance and because of the collaboration of public and private, we get a lot of adoption and use because 
people can have their say and add things that they need and then they can start using it. So, um, and, and you know, that, that of course doesn't happen just like that. It, it's a process. Um, and to, to your last question there, that last paragraph about concessions, we've been pretty good so far with not having um, to make a lot of concessions. The things that the community has come up with have been very usually very reasonable. I think that there is a bit um, to your first part about those negotiations and political trade-offs that have come up in some conversations and there has had to be some consensus on. So one of the ones, for example, um, is I, I mentioned this policy requirements where cities can say, hey, we, um, we don't want this field that's required, you know, or we do want this field that's optional. Cities were initially very hesitant to include that ability. It sounds like something that cities would want, but what they were afraid of was that operators would come to cities who are not as knowledgeable and say, hey, you don't need all this data. Just request from us this subset of data, and we have an easy way for you to request less data. And we think that's what you should go with. And then the city gets less information and it's less useful, and the operators can maybe some some operators could do things that were not as honest um, and not as auditable. So that was an interesting thing. And, and before we came up with the concept of the policy requirements where the cities could define that, there was a lot of talk about, well, we just need to make trip lines optional in MDS instead of required. Or we need to make these required fields all optional so that a city can just, or an operator can just not send them if they don't want to. So the, the requirements are sort of a, a compromise there where the cities end up having to publish it. So they still have control over what they want and what they don't want. And maybe they could be influenced by the operators, but they could always change that later pretty easily. So this was a way to make pieces of MDS optional that operators um, and cities may want or don't want or can't collect or you know are allowed to collect or definitely want to collect. So it gave that flexibility. So that whole feature is kind of a consensus. Um, the other area is like the, the K values and the when do we remove data? The thresholds for that are were, were a bit of a discussion. Like some people thought, well, you know, if there's a large geography and there's only, you know, three trips in there, well, maybe that's good enough. But then some people are like, oh, you need 20. You know, you need at least 20 in an area. And so there was this big discussion and we could sort of settled on 10 as a reasonable number. Um, so anyway, there was a little discussion around that. Um, but really everything, everything else has been very consensus driven and we do reach compromises, but um, they're typically not that contentious. I think the contentious part was the initial creation of MDS from LADOT when LA said, hey, we've got this data spec and we want all these operators to use it. And then other cities started using it. That's where a lot of operators initially pushed back. But I think in the end, they realized it's better for them because instead of bespoke data requests in every city in the world, they have a standard now. And so they can just build towards that. Um, so I think that also helped with a lot of that contentiousness. Um, I think we have time for one or two more. Um, I'd like to ask another, oh, there's um, a couple that we have in the chat and um, I'll read those and serve them to you in a moment. I, I had a question um, for you about the GDPR compatibility. In, in my personal experience working internationally and a lot in Europe um, on data issues, you find that frequently some sort of like methodology or a mode of thinking about the realm of of the possible for analytics kind of like stops at the Atlantic Ocean. How did that come about that um, GDR compatibility and GDPR guidebooks became a piece of that? Because that that is um, maybe I'm naive, but that seems very unique to me. Yeah, so it's a great question. It was something we spent a lot of time on um, because what, here's what started to happen is that 
you know, MDS was out there, cities in Europe in particular were using MDS, but then there were a number of cities that were unsure about if they could use MDS or not under the new GDPR guidelines. So we then had cities like Paris, um, for instance, who started, and Amsterdam, who started to create their own specs or versions of MDS. And we, we just thought, well, they don't need to do that because we could instead spend some time clarifying how it works under GDPR. Um, and so we really took the initiative. We actually hired an EU uh, lawyer from France to work with the privacy committee over six months to come up with these questions and answer these questions and provide rounds of feedback with European organizations like Polis, um, which is like a city led transportation organization. Um, and, and other entities in, in the EU and our EU members and our EU vendors and cities and we refined it so that I think what the, the end result was all these cities that were making their own thing now have started using MDS. So Paris uses MDS, London, etc. Um, so that, I think that was we knew we hoped that would happen once we clarified how it all worked and gave people the tools and the answers they needed. Um, and we saw it as a real priority because, you know, MDS is being used around the world, but we didn't want it. We don't want to limit it to just the United States. We want to make it accessible for everyone. And that's a real accessibility issue in the EU. So we took it as a priority and came up with some answers for that. I think that's great. Um, so, okay, let's have one last question. This is from a student of ours, Shinjay. Um, and I think this is a, I think this is a great question. How do you deal with no data in urban data? Because data collection is not as homogenous as urban infrastructure. The amount of data is not large enough or too much bad data for it to be meaningful. So I think in, in that sense, like this is all, having a standard is all great. What if you have a garbage in garbage out problem? How do you deal with um, the devices and, and the variability of the data that come from them? Yeah, I think there's a few issues that can crop up here so one is like the hardware on the device is malfunctioning or it's not accurate or they cut corners so you don't get good gps points or it's not frequent enough um, you can't make sense of it um, there's a lot of that and i think what has happened over the years is that those operators that have that sort of equipment that wasn't working they've in many ways been pushed out of the market um, and instead, the quality of the devices have increased, the quality of the, the equipment and the GPS and the, the speedometers and the odometers on the devices and other sensors, tipping sensors. A lot more has been added over the years than removed, and it's gotten higher quality. Um, some There's some companies even that have like cameras on board that could, that can detect whether you're on a sidewalk or not. and use that to determine your GPS coordinates more accurately. So anyway, it's, it's improved a lot. The other side is like the company gets the data from the devices and then they send it through MDS, but they're not doing that right. Like they um, truncate things or they don't do it, don't understand how MDS works and they send too much data that they shouldn't be sending that's inaccurate. Or like for instance, a lot of, some companies would send data of scooters that are sitting in a warehouse and as if they were on a trip, but they're just like sitting there being worked on, but that should not show up in the data because that's not in the scope of MDS. Um, or they or they have bad data, like they have huge gaps in GPS that they've decided to leave out. So you just get these lines instead of a, an actual route. Um, but in those cases, th those have gotten better too. A lot of times, I think most of the times with that, it's more of a, software pipeline issue with the operator and when the cities inform them of that they go and fix it um, and so the, the data quality has been increasing over the years more and more um, and i think that's i think it's pretty good now there's still a little bit of confusion sometimes or under misunderstandings about how mds is meant to be used in some cases which means how the data is sent but we usually we hear about those things in our meetings and we'll go back and refine the spec or make it more clear about when to use which things um, and provide guidance. And so I think that's getting better and better. Um, I mean, you could still have a situation and maybe this is part of the question too, where you have a city and you're, you know, you've got one operator and there's, they've got a hundred devices, maybe, maybe like a bike share or something. 
you know, you can't probably can't use that to plan infrastructure so much because it's just not enough data. But typically, um, when you're in a city with bike share or scooter share, there's a lot of data. I mean, there's like, you know, millions of rides and a lot of information that you can use. And so you're able to use that in a, in a way to make decisions. Yeah, I think it's um, even even going back to our last project together in 2020. I mean, the the development of these technologies and the like it just increased um, level of service from the providers and stuff like that is is very very notable. It was you know to watch this go from sort of wild west, uh, you know, six seven years ago. To where it is now is is amazing um yeah so i i want to thank michael for joining us um this evening i want to thank all of you who um came out to to listen to the talk we're going to post this on um a various weitzman school uh video channels um in the coming days or weeks um so you know if you want to go back and get it take another close listen you can um but again i want to thank michael for for joining us i really enjoyed this talk and um we look forward to seeing what's next for you uh with open mobility foundation yeah thanks a lot for having me i hope it was interesting i hope the recording um gives people some more things to think about. And if you have questions in the mobility space or about cities or about MDS or CDS, please don't hesitate to reach out on our website. Um, it comes right to us and we'll get back to you. Awesome. And I think the last plug I would make is that if you are a nonprofit or a city um, and you are interested in partnering with the MUSA program uh, to do projects like the ones that Michael was referencing in his talk, um, please look us up and get in contact. Um, and we would love to chat about a project just like this because this is how um, we get, we not only innovate through research and applied work, but really it's about getting our students ready to come and and work in the in the real world so it's just a, a win-win um so thank you very much and um uh have a good evening everybody great thank you michael thank you musa <laughs>